Hello. This video will outline the latest addition to my ebook, which is about the phenomenon of the S to express both singularity and plurality. The role of the affix S can be seen in a different light, as it often points to the aspect of either approximation or grouping, and is not strictly plural. First of all, since English uses verbs as both nouns and adjectives, or vice versa, a noun or adjective becoming a verb should clue us in to the fact that parts of speech we assign words are rather arbitrary. For one, the word verb itself in Latin, which is verbus, simply means word. When examining the usage of S more holistically, we find it can serve as either singular, as evidenced in the verb declination in the third person singular, uh, which is, by the way, apart from the affixed ed, uh, the phenomenon of apophathy for a verb sound change to indicate past. In both contexts, it's the only conjugation in English. I explain that the presence of S on verbs, specifically in the indicative mood, can signal a fact, a generalization, but also diversity, or then a routine or habitual action. The S in is, and goes, and other verbs ending in vowel sounds and weak consonants are pronounced as a Z, and what is Z but a backward S? We have Adam, which is some consider singular, others consider Adam to be plural, and we have uh, Eve, the second person, you. And the serpent, or snake, is the third person. The S is also shown in she before he. Note that whenever we affix S to a word in English, it's always pronounced, whether as a Z or Z sound. While the presence of the S leans towards generalization, presenting a unified front, its absence or quiescence serves to announce hypernomy, something or someone as a unit or whole. Either way, what's fascinating is how this seemingly small grammatical alteration will greatly impact interpretation and give nuance. It goes deeper than merely saying that an S serves a different function when affixed to a verb than when it is uh, used for so-called plural count noun. For one, we could look at things inversely and say that when we remove the S from a verb, we are eliciting specificity, I, you, and the inclusive we, also by grouping with exclusive we, uh, where you also serves to mean generalization, which often supersedes the pronoun one. The omission of S for the generic you implies a subjunctive mood, a kind of zero S in correlation to the zero article. Adding the S where a word is normally a hypernym, as opposed to a hyponym, will elicit approximation, so governments in general, or conversely removing an S, let's say on people, uh, for persuasively expressing unity to contrast populations, a less intimate and more general term. The presence or absence of S can affect the interpretation of toward, forward, backward. Though affixing S is clearly not pluralization, in this case especially, uh, it does hint at more approximation or dire of direction and generalization, not to mention notions of intellectualism. I will show you the end graph towards our objectives, to the general direction implied. We see in the graph that toward and those followed by the definite article or indefinite articles uh, and without the S is statistically speaking more common, but just as used with an S. The only markable gap is found with towards and compared to toward and where possibly the S is elided 
for simplicity. We can't say a backwards theory, but that is a conventional aspect of English insofar as all adjectives aren't inflected. Yet backwards with an S implies approximation or even hypothesis. Since you cannot really go back, only forward, you can glance forward, but glancing backwards over your shoulder, because you can't really turn your head 180 degrees. The argument of something being American or British English is totally unfounded, except in a statistical sense. Toward implies a direct path, explicit, while towards suggests a less, less defined, more general direction when used with intellectual abstract nouns and noun phrases, uh, if not unknown or general processes. We could extrapolate that even the affixing of S to any way clues us in to this approximation. In contrast, anyway, signposts an explicit change of subject to come. That is not to say that further linguistic research might be opportune if one is to confirm this observation. I simply wish to shed light on both the flexible nature of English and to debunk Latin-based analyses, for instance, the term irregular and uncountable uh, likewise, amongst is not archaic, as academics will claim. The resultative T sound serves to indicate result, and the S serves to stress approximation. Suppressing S's and T's does not change the fact that those sounds serve respective functions, morphologically. Why noodle and vegetable are generally pluralized has more to do with their implying one amongst several kinds of noodle and uh, made from any number of ingredients, wheat, rice, buckwheat, etc. By now we should begin to see an underlying subtle use of the S as an affix. If we take this a step further, the letter S in initial position in various contexts, we should find a parallel in terms of its phonetic significance. The S spe speaks of seduction, drawing a parallel with the image of a serpent or snake that sheds its skin, metamorphoses and transformation, but also systematics and the sounds themselves. S is also found to represent fric frictionless motion, as in slide, slick, and sled, and the SH sound sh onomatopoeically represents sustained loudness or rushing sound and denotes forceful or destructive contact. Consider smash, crash, and bash. This suggests a phonetic connection between the sh sound and the concept of forceful impact. The st cluster conveys a sense of stability, strength, or rigidity, as in stable, statue, stand, stout, and steel, but also sharpness and pointedness. Consider stab, stylus, stiletto, and sting. And the SN cluster appears in words related to the mouth, nose, or snout, in sounds such as snarl, snicker, or the crackling of a snack. So in my ebook, you will find this file here, and it's also available as a PDF on two sites. There you can see singular or plural. I explained it here a little bit further. Pasta, technically singular, since pasti would be the plural in Italian, is considered non-countable, but for reasons which elude most of us. The same goes for vegetable. We affix an S generally, and we'll say veggies, but we won't say it without an S, generally a veggie. It's generally plural and infers a group of several edible vegetation. Again, the S affixed to vegetable represents approximation, especially since these may include seeds, beans, nuts, 
which are actually shelled fruit. Fruit tends to be singular as they are byproduct of plants and the S on plant being diverse plantations. The English logic is dependent not upon whether we can count, but on whether we decide or bother to count something. If I add onion to a sauce, it is one ingredient. How many onions I decide to add is a question of taste or convention. Not number, but amount relative to quantity. So I can say I add onion or onions interchangeably. Similarly, I won't say I add garlics. In other words, we really need to look at the logic of S as being approximation or grouping or diversification rather than plurality. Comparable is how we see that a majority of verbs in the third person singular take an S, while G German prefers the T for third person singular, English prefers S, but we don't call it irregularity. Likewise, good for German, gut from German gut and better from besser are not irregular adjectives, it's simply a consonant change. And uh, I go th in more in detail in my book on apophony. Are tomatoes a vegetable or a fruit? And do we bother to make that distinction? Words like backwards, as I say, may or may not have an S. Uh, but when they have an S, they tend to indicate approximation, mostly in direction, figuratively or physically. When speaking of family, uh, are you considering the immediate family members or the unit? Could the zero S missing from subject and verb actually infer a diversity of the extended family, playing down the number of members in any one group? Although staff itself generally doesn't take an S to mean individual staff members, when speaking of several groups of staff, we do see staffs. But it's because the S infers an unspecified diversity. Either is possible in the case of using a plural inference, whether we choose to add S or to staff, will mean omitting an S on the verb. When referring to sticks or canes, several staff will become staves. Note the apophony of the F to V, as well as the S to Z. If you have a unit in mind, it would mean that the staff members are unanimous. The staff is commendable. However, if you said the staff are commendable, we might leave a doubt that this related uh, to all members of the staff, as in some staff members are unfriendly towards the guests. The police is seen as a unit and is singular when we include force, but this, this, this doesn't relate to the number of uh, staff. In the context of security, at least, police employees uh, rarely al work alone and often in twos. In pair or pairs? Well, in general, in pairs. With this, I hope to extrapolate that English is flexible that way. In other cases, such as with the uh, use of question tags, uh, hedging, English is more rigid. People, to mean a populace, from the French word peuple, meaning a people, is generally singular. When talking about a people to mean a tribe or folk in English, we can say peoples. The people is generally considered plural with an elided S. And here's something to illustrate that people is not solely plural. If you say a free people, a whole people, a great people, a civilized people, or uh, the American people, common people, Roman people, and so on. Collective nouns are generally singular, a warlike people singular as it refers to a nation or community. Other cases, you have the government, usually singular, the jury, a group of 12 appointed for court hearings. 
Uh, stationery is paper, envelopes. Faculty is a group of teachers, class, a group of students, and a pride of lions, and so on. So there you have it. I hope this gives you an insider look at English and the S, like the serpent, in contrast to the German T, which is the cross. All right, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.